Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're talking with Dr. William Walsh. He is president of the nonprofit Walsh Research Institute near Chicago and an internationally acknowledged expert on biochemical imbalances. We're discussing his book, Nutrient Power, which describes an evidence-based nutrient therapy system and is a result of his over 30 years of research and clinical experience. Dr. Walsh, welcome to the show. Well, hi, Rebecca. Glad to be with you. So what inspired you to put this book together? Well, really, uh, I found that people didn't appreciate the importance and, and, and the power that nutrients can have on, on mental health and on physical health. And uh, so when I decided to write this book, um, I, I, I decided that the title should be Nutrient Power because that, that was the message above all that I wanted to get across to people that uh, nutrients can have tremendous power um, on, on a, a way a person functions. And, uh, of course, it all depends on a person's individuality. And so that, that's, uh, that's why I wrote the book. So, um, you, you know, I, 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 loved, I loved your book. And, and um, this topic has been touched on before when I interviewed uh, Stephanie Marone about uh, her book on schizophrenia. And um, it, it just is baffling to me when you take such complicated illnesses, which is what you're doing, and, and, it, it, and having such seemingly simple treatments for them. Yeah, I think what it really comes down to is understanding what is actually going on in the brain and, and uh, how things can go wrong. And when something goes wrong, when neurotransmission is abnormal, uh, we've developed a system for identifying which neurotransmission systems are not functioning right and how to correct them without using drugs. So, um, before we get into a lot of, of what you're doing, can you just give us a little bit of history on mental illness and, and what people have been dealing with um, for, for a long time, the stigma and all that? Well, yeah, this goes back, of course, uh, thousands and thousands of years. Uh, the Bible says that King Saul uh, committed suicide, and... Um, bipolar depression was was known a thousand years BC and really um, um, things were really pretty bad in, in, in terms of lack of science or real logic early on the the theory originally was that there were demons or devils inside your brain that were causing it not to function right and the number one therapy for more than more than uh, 200 years actually a thousand years was to drill holes in your skull to help the evil spirits leave or help them or cause them to leave. Um, it wasn't until the early 1800s that science and medicine began to focus on mental problems as, as really a, as disorders that, that needed examination and treatment. So that, that's sort of the history of it all. And what happened in, in the 1800s to me is just amazing. The, the ability of researchers with you know, very little high-tech stuff to help them. Um, they discovered the neuron. They discovered that neurons uh, communicate chemically. They learned about synapses. Um, I'm just as dazzled by the uh, ability of uh, these researchers. And, and what happened uh, around 1900, the focus came on life experiences in psychiatry. And, and this, this really went on until 1965 as the major idea, namely that people become depressed, anxious, schizophrenic, bipolar, etc., uh, because of their life experiences and the things that affected their brain, sort of a psychosomatic, uh, psychosocial kind of thing. And that the Freudian and Jungian and Adlerian philosophies all... Um, did that. So if you had depression and you were in 1955, they would put you, you would be, you find yourself on a couch uh, a talk, talking to a psychiatrist probably who would then um, 
delve into your, especially into your early life looking for trauma that might have caused the condition. This all changed in 1965 with what I call the biochemical revolution in psychiatry. And that's when they realized that the strongest um, uh, decider of whether a person becomes mentally ill is, is not life experiences, but, but, but um, has a genetic background. They found that these things ran in families. Identical twin studies and, and adoption studies prove that the molecular biology and neurotransmission and, and receptors and all of that were really a dominant factor. Since that time, the focus has been on medication, on drug medication to, to help these people. And the reason is that they didn't know any, any other way to impact neurotransmitters. And I, to me, I believe this is a uh, temporary expedient that psychiatric drugs have helped millions of people. But it's, I, I think that as time goes on and as knowledge improves and science advances, we'll be able to normalize the brain and help these people uh, function properly uh, without having to insert powerful foreign molecules that really well, don't you, normalize the brain and, and have usually pretty nasty side effects. So that's kind of well, a long answer to your question. I hope that's okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I love I love hearing that. And I think we all know that, that um, you know, mental health still has a, a stigma around it. I mean, why can't you just get out of bed and, and get through stuff? Um, and there, there's yeah. a lot of shame, shame around it. And then and then when you come to the, the medication, as you said, they've helped millions of people, but some people choose not to take them. Um, so I think that's more common, especially with schizophrenia. But, um, you know, the side effects can be just as debilitating. Um, and or just uh, unwanted, um, and that makes it very difficult to to treat as well. There, there certainly still is a stigma uh, for even even depression, and mo- many people who have serious depression and are terribly bothered by it, and, and mental pain can be worse than physical pain. Uh, many of them just try to hide this from all of their their family and their friends and their colleagues uh, because it, it, they think of it as a weakness. Um, but that's really not true. We now know science is now proving that these are are diseases that that uh, can can attack anyone and can overwhelm anyone. Um, and and so the stigma really is inappropriate. But it's going to take a while for that to fade away. Well, and I also have found um, that sometimes doctors use it as a as an excuse if they can't figure out what's going on, and whether it's a, a valid label that they're giving you. Well, it's just depression, um, you know, and then you're you can't get help anymore because um, they're like, well, you're just depressed. Um, and uh, uh, I've, that, I've worked you know. with um, hundreds of psychiatrists, and they're as a group, they're really wonderful people trying to help their patients. But I've also met many who think that once they do the diagnosis, that they're job is done and their focus is really on, on naming it rather than fixing it and, um, and and right now unfortunately we're in a mental health um, clinical system where a lot of it is trial and error use of drugs in the USA in particular it takes us uh, a psychiatrist is only allowed about 30 minutes with an initial visit from a, a mentally ill person and they spend most of their time sitting there wondering what drug should I give them that's not really why they went to medical school. Uh, what, what's really needed is to, uh, what we've developed is we've developed a system for, for um, special laboratory tests and, and, and an extensive medical history that can identify which neurotransmitter systems have gone wrong and in, in, in what direction. For example, we, we now are quite accurate in identifying people who have low serotonin activity and others who might have high norepinephrine. And I think that's the key. To focus really should be on identifying what systems in the brain have have not been functioning properly and then developing uh, hopefully natural ways to fix that. So um, with what with what you're doing, we're going to go into to more detail. But I, I find it really interesting that um, you know you're either getting people off their medication or at least lowering their doses, as well as they're they're not um, having symptoms anymore, which they were on their medication. If I'm understanding your book correctly, 
you, you are understanding it correctly, and basically this is just the beginning. As, as science advances, as time goes on, the use of psychiatric drugs will fade away and will be replaced by, by techniques for normalizing the brain. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So um, when, when we're looking at um, the, the neurotransmitters, um, what, what exactly is happening there, say, in depression? And, and really, I guess, you know, we use the term neurotransmitters, but, but what are they as well? Well, uh, two years ago, uh, I went to the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. And uh, uh, there were 17,000 psychiatrists from all over the world, and I, I gave a talk in a very, very large auditorium with hundreds, possibly a thousand people there. And uh, basically, I explained to them they were doing depression all wrong. That in fact, it's an umbrella term given to at least five completely different diseases. And the problem is they they have the misconception that if you have clinical depression. Uh, that, that you have low serotonin activity, serotonin being one of the brain chemicals. Real, real, for some people, it's, 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 it's the key factor with depression, but for others, it's not. I've got the world's largest chemical database for depression, more than 3,600 people. And it's really quite clear there are totally different forms of, dep- of what we call depression. And they each have different neurotransmitters that are misbehaving. And they all need, and each, every one of them needs a completely different treatment approach. And uh, since that time, uh, one, one of my organization's activities is training doctors. And uh, we, we, in the last few years, we have trained hundreds and hundreds of doctors, including some really great doctors from your area. And um, they, and what we're teaching them to do is how to do inexpensive lab tests and a careful medical history, which can identify what treatment really should be given to this particular individual. So, um, you know, if we're talking about serotonin, you're saying that not everybody with depression has low serotonin. Absolutely right. In fact, we know it's 38 percent. 38% of people, and, and in fact, if you get, and these are the people who do well on, on, on SSRIs because that, that, that particular form of a drug, it enhances serotonin activity. And however, there's one of the groups, 20% of all people with depression actually have too much serotonin activity, and they're the ones who get dramatically worse if they take an SSRI. And an SSRI just, and that's, only um, one, and that's of course only one, uh, one, one neurotransmitter. The others we focus on are dopamine, norepinephrine, and the NMDA system, which is the glutamate system. Those four seem to be um, really dominant in, in the, but the problem is that most mentally ill people have. Um. So just so that everybody knows, SSRIs are a common treatment for depression. And so you're saying that only 38% of people with depression um, actually will respond to SSRIs and, and, and get, you know, it's something that they need. And that's only 38%. That's what our data tells us. And oh, there are 80, 38% have one of these types or biotypes, or we call them phenotypes, of depression. And they're the ones who have, as their major dominant problem, low serotonin activity. And these SSRI uh, antidepressants fix it. There's another group of about 15% that get some minor benefit from, from that. They have other things wrong. But, uh, so it really comes out to roughly half of people who have clinical depression are, are really good candidates for an SSRI antidepressant. But the other half are not, and many of them can get terribly worse if they were to do that. And throughout the world, if somebody is diagnosed with depression, most, most of the psychiatrists or other practitioners uh, will start them on an, on, on, on an SSRI. It's, um, so I, I, I'm trying to uh, persuade, myself and many others are trying to persuade the field of psychiatry to become more scientific and really more capable in helping people. So and the, and the major weapons we use are nutrients, because nutrients have great power. We have the ability now with nutrients, if we understand which neurotransmitter systems have gone wrong, we now have the ability 
to to alter that and 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 normalize neurotransmission in many cases with nutrients. You know, I find it interesting that that when you see people with with some, you know, just like depression, I mean, schizophrenia is is more complicated. But, um, you know, you're doing testing. Whereas if you went to your doctor and said you were depressed, they would give you a medication, and then you would see how you went on it. And if it didn't work, you would try another one. Um, and it. it and and you're saying only 50% of people will get better and 38% it will be all they need and the rest are going to need more. Um, so it, it seems so, to me like there's no. something broken in that in that system that, um, you know, we're just saying here's a medication. They're making it seem very simple. And it seems, especially from reading your book, that it's way more complicated than that. It is. And I think the uh, neuroscientists know this. And it's uh, taking a long time for the science to make its way into clinical practice and help people. Uh, the, there is remarkable, wonderful new information that is all published and, and is, is pretty well accepted. But uh, the, the, it seems to be taking a long time because um, there's a lot of money in drug medications. In fact, most of the major uh, antidepressants and other other medications for mental health are, are really billion-dollar drugs where the, the, there's an enormous amount of money that is made, and so uh, there are large corporations that are doing their really their best to, to keep their sales up. And so whenever something new comes along that might uh, obsolete one of their drugs, they, they uh, have a lot of resources to sort of fight it and to uh, slow it down. And that's one of the issues, especially in America. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Dr. William Walsh. Um, we're discussing his book, Nutrient Power, and we'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Riss. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Dr. William Walsh, and we're discussing his book, Nutrient Power. So, Dr. Walsh, in your book, you talk a lot about um, methylation. What, what is that? Well, methylation is one of the most important chemical reactions in, in the human body. And um, first of all, in the womb, um, 
in the nine months of gestation, of nine months of a pregnancy, then one of the ma- our DNA is um, controls and nurtures every cell in our body. So right now we have about thirty trillion DNAs in our body, and they're working for us day and night. And what they do is they they decide which chemicals, which special chemicals, go to each different kind of cell. And it's all done by methylation. It's uh, as as a person goes through the nine months of a pregnancy, as a fetus goes through this, there are different methylation reactions that shut off unwanted chemicals for, say, in the kidney or the heart or the liver. And it's, it's a it's a system called epigenetics. Epigenetics, which is getting uh, pretty popular now, although it's really highly understood. And um, anyway, methylation is something that. Um, we, we've known for years there are about 80 really important methylation reactions in the human body. Um, and in 1999, I had the world's largest database for autism, chemistry database for autism. And we discovered, looking at the database, that virtually all autistic children were under-methylated. And then, we've, and then following up on that, we found that methylation has a lot to do with depression and anxiety and schizophrenia. If your methylation is abnormal, your brain function will be abnormal. And there's been a, a, just a huge amount of studies on this uh, since 1999. And uh, we, we test every, every patient we see. We've now seen 30,000 patients that I've been associated with. We test every one of them for their methylation status. And we, and if there, a person can, we found that seventy uh, percent of Americans are normal with respect to methylation. Twenty-two percent are under-methylated, and eight percent are over-methylated. And uh, we've d- developed nutrient therapies that can tend to normalize methylation and can really help a lot of people. There's a lot of human misery associated with ADHD and autism and schizophrenia, on and on. And we've we've learned this is really a a way to get right directly to the heart of the matter. And that is explained in my book. Um, So what what does it mean if you're over or under-methylated? If you're over-methylated, what methylation does to your DNA, it tends to shut down a particular gene. Every gene has, we've got about 20,000 genes, and every gene's only got one job, and that's to make a, a particular chemical. And these chemicals are produced all day, every day, and nourish our bodies, every part of our body. And so if you're over-methylated, you tend to, to have less gene expressions in certain, in many of these 20,000 genes. If you're under-methylated, you tend to have too much uh, genetic expression and too much you, you can shower uh, some cells with too much of these particular chemicals. So that's what a lot of disease, disease actually is. And uh, so now there, um, we now know enough about DNA and about genetics that there are ways of identifying uh, specific parts of the DNA that are real. Uh, typically, if you have mutation, they call them SNPs, SNPs, um, that, that, can, that, that can identify people who are prone to over or under methylation. People who are over methylated have, uh, have distinctive symptoms and traits. They're born different. Every, every parent who's had several children realizes how intrinsically different these, these children often are, totally different in their personality, and, and, and it's really their methylation that determines that. If you're under methylated, you probably are competitive. You probably, 75% likelihood that you have seasonal allergies. Uh, people with, who are under-methylated tend to be people of high accomplishment. Uh, most medical schools, I, I think 90 to 95% of all doctors are under-methylated because part of being under-methylated is a tendency to be competitive, perfectionistic, to be the best at what you can do. If they play a sport, they want to win. It's not just for the fun of it. Whereas over-methylated people are more social. They're, 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 they uh, have more empathy for others. There's uh, very interesting characteristics between those who are over-methylated and under-methylated. The problem with under-methylation, even though these people tend to be the great athletes or the heads of government, heads of universities, etc., uh, they're prone to depression. They're prone to obsessive-compulsive disorder. They're prone to allergies. 
Um, so there's the good and the bad in either case. In overmethylation, they have a tendency more for anxiety disorders, uh, for, for paranoid schizophrenia, uh, and they have higher amounts, uh, higher tendency for f- food and chemical sensitivities. And so we've, we've made a list of about 30 uh, tendencies and traits that are associated with under or overmethylation. And we've developed nutrient therapies that can, that can help people who are, if they happen to be suffering from something related to methylation, uh, we, we now know how to help most of them. So when, when we're talking about the nutrient therapies, wh- what does that look like for somebody? And, and I know it's probably different for everybody depending on what you find, but my, I guess people are probably wondering, what are you giving them? It depends on their, their biochemical diagnosis. If a person is under-methylated, uh, first of all, uh, that, that means they probably are some of these people that we talked about that have low serotonin activity. And so if you wanted to help them with medication, they would be great candidates for the SSRI antidepressants. However, uh, we now know why, how these antidepressants function. We know specifically what they do to the, in the brain. They work on, 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 on chemicals that are called transporter proteins, and they, and they sort of block their function, and it's called reuptake. They're reuptake inhibitors, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Well. We, we now know that we can do the same thing using methionine, which is a natural amino acid that is over-the-counter, and, and, and more recently, SAMIs, uh, which I think a lot of your listeners are aware of. That's a, that's a methylator. It's a chemical that actually is the major methylation uh, source in the human body. And so uh, we also know that people who are under-methylated tend to be low in calcium and magnesium. We know that they tend to have high oxidative stress. We know that they tend to be uh, vulnerable to toxic metals like mercury and lead and cadmium. And so we supply them with a strong antioxidant uh, protection, and we directly give them the, the um, either methionine or SAMI, which changes the genetic expression of these very important reuptake proteins that are stuck in your in the in, in the membranes of all your brain cells, so uh, we're guided by science, and we've learned that in at least eighty percent of the cases of depression or behavior disorders or ADD or whatever, if they have um, if if they have under methylation, that eighty percent of them usually get nicely better. And, and a, a, a good share of them no longer need a medication to feel okay. But it's all very specific. It all depends on a person's biochemical individuality. Well, and and if you're comparing over and, and under methylation, would the treatment kind of be the opposite so you don't trigger one to get worse where it could help the other? It is exactly the opposite because we know that depression has a lot to do with ther- serotonin reuptake and in one case you want to inhibit that uptake in the other case you want to enhance it so yeah they're exactly opposite and it turns out that that the two natural nutrients that tend to uh, to oppose each other are methyl and folates and in one case you need to emphasize methyl in the other case you need to emphasize folates the the overmethylated people thrive on folates because that directly affects uh, the, the, the chemistry at their neurons. What's really peculiar is that methyl and folates both tend to enhance methylation, but they have, a, they have an effect on gene expression that is opposite, and that dominates what's going on in depression. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like it, it does get complicated. I know, you know, reading your book, it always sound, sounded like what you're doing is very simple. Here's some vitamin C, vitamin E, some zinc. But, of course, you have to understand what's going on in that person's body so that you don't do the opposite of what you're trying to do. You're right, and, and that's a good example. Uh, metal metabolism is, is very often a problem. We've learned that um, looking at these 30,000 mentally ill people, um, that that there are about seven nutrient imbalances that dominate their brain function uh, in case of uh, people who are, are, are not doing well. And, and zinc, for example, um, I think most people get enough zinc from their diet and don't need any. However, uh, we do plasma zinc tests. We test their blood, and it's amazing. 
uh, the high number of people with depression or behavior disorders or schizophrenia that really are very low in zinc. And so we've developed uh, uh, treatments, uh, nutrient therapies that can normalize zinc levels in people. We know that copper uh, very often is elevated in certain cases. It's very high in many people with, uh, with schizophrenia. It is high. It is, we believe it's the cause primarily of postnatal depression. We've now done more than 800 women who suffered from postnatal depression, and we find that more than 95% of them have really elevated copper levels. They're, they don't have the natural ability to normalize copper, which you're suppo- everybody's supposed to have, but it doesn't work for them. And, it real, and so during a pregnancy, a woman's copper level more than doubles, and that's necessary for the growth of the, of the little baby. However, uh, at, at, at term, when the, when after delivery, the copper level is supposed to go right back down to normal, and for them it doesn't happen. And so actually, uh, one of our... One of our favorite groups of patients are women who suffer from postnatal depression because the success rate based on our outcome studies is better than 90%. And we can fix that without resorting to any drug. All we have to do is, is normalize their copper level. And, it, and we now know why. We know that copper, if you've got excessive copper, it causes an extraordinary increase in norepinephrine and adrenaline. And that's a recipe for, for anxiety and depression. And uh, so we can really tailor the functioning of those two, uh, of, of norepinephrine, really also dopamine, by, by, uh, by just correcting the mental metabolism. It's a, it only takes about 60 days, usually, to, to straighten that out. That's, um, yeah, it's amazing when you consider what people go through when they're in those situations as well and medications that don't work and that, and that kind of process. And, and, um, it's never looked at as a metal metabolism issue. And I think if you said that to your doctor, you would be probably considered a little crazy as well. Well, we now have 650 doctors that we have trained to use these pr- protocols. It's, it's growing and growing throughout the world. We've got, we've got doctors now in, in, thir- in 28 different countries that are doing this. And uh, what they tell me is uh, that, that they, they, they have great success with postnatal depression for this reason. Because the, these women are all, virtually all of them are really blooded and over, overwhelmed with too much copper in their blood. And mm-hmm. all they have to do is normalize it, which we are we now know how to do that. Um, the the I think this is just growing and growing. My my book, by the way, uh, I wrote this seven years ago. It got published six years ago, and the the sales of it are just growing and growing. It's now an Amazon bestseller. It's now available in seven languages, and uh, it's it's really popular in places like Japan and Germany and China. Um, and, and the, but the important thing is, is, is that it's a way to help patients. It's a way to more sensibly and more directly help people who might have uh, a, like a violent child. Another group of people that we are, have our, really our best results with, along with the postpartum depression group, are violent children, children with, with physical violence. And that's really how we started. We find that, that this is, is usually... In, an inborn tendency. I learned this by working with, uh, I was a prison volunteer early on, and that's how I really got started, wondering why these people were so violent and did such terrible things. And eventually, I started an ex-offender program, helped trying to help them um, not repeat these crimes when they got out. And I got to meet their families. And I learned from the, the mothers especially that they knew there was something wrong with this child by the time they were six months old. And by the time they were two or three or four, the, these kids were horrifying their family by torturing their pets and, in some cases, murdering their, the family pet. They were oppositional and defiant and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's how we got started. And so behavior disorders and ADHD are um, two of the easiest groups to, to benefit. The hardest people to treat are those with psychosis and autism. Uh, and the reason is that these are, we believe, a special group of disorders that are what we call epigenetic in nature, that they've had something go wrong that causes their gene expression to be permanently changed. And it usually happens later in life. Um, 
most, most schizophrenia breakdowns are around the age of 20. And what happens is that uh, there's a se- sequence of events that, um, that can cause gene expression to suddenly change. And it's, it's like an event that happens all at once, usually. And then it doesn't go away. And another example is bipolar disorder. Um, we just presented a, our, uh, we just developed a, a, a theory of bipolar disorder. In my book, there, there are chapters on depression, schizophrenia, behavior, autism, dementia. There's no chapter on, on bipolar. And that's because I didn't think I knew enough about bipolar to write a chapter on it. And since that time, I've been studying it really, really intensively. And I just, just looking at all the neuroscience advances throughout the world, and based on other people's work, I, I've discovered what I believe it truly is. And I just um, reported this uh, about six weeks ago at the uh, American Psychiatric Association annual meeting. So I think we now know exactly what it is. And I think this, is, this kind of thing is science is going to guide us in helping people who have anxiety and depression and, and these other problems. Well, you know, I, I, I do love to hear this. I actually lost my brother to schizophrenia several years ago. And, um, you know, he didn't like the medication and he he didn't, um, you know, want to do any of the treatment and he was stuck in a loop. And I, I know from your, reading your book that your treatment doesn't have those side effects and can eventually bring the person back to almost normal, which is very encouraging when you're dealing with something that that is so overwhelming and so hard to treat as well. The, the person who started this was a Canadian. It was Dr. Abram Hoffer out of Vancouver. And uh, he he, treat, he then um, inspired Dr. Carl Pfeiffer in the U.S. And those two uh, leaders that focused on schizophrenia. And between them, they, they saw more than 30,000 schizophrenics. And they had remarkable success in helping them. Uh, and basically, I, I, I was... I got lucky and got to know these two gentlemen, and and I, I learned of the science and the techniques that they were doing, and I have to I have to credit them for in any progress we've made in schizophrenia. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we're talking today with Dr. William Walsh, and we're discussing his book Nutrient Power. So we'll, we'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has a mobile app for iOS, Android, or Amazon Kindle. Visit the Apple App Store, Amazon, or Google Play to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of Return to Peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN or follow along with us at Voice America TRN. The Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You 
are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking to Dr. William Walsh. He is the author of Nutrient Power. Um, Dr. Walsh, I want to go um, to the epigenetics uh, topic. I know a lot of people believe that if something is in their genetics, they're going to be predisposed to it, and that is their blueprint for life, and it can't be changed. Um, so what is your, your view on that? Well, what I what I've learned and what I what I tell all of these patients that if uh, if I'm talking to somebody who's a schizophrenic or somebody with with anxiety disorder, and I find out that their family history is just full of people who did this, so they got plenty of relatives who had the same problem. Many of them feel well, it's inevitable, it's genetic, and I'm doomed. And the answer is no. We find we get our our best results are with people who who have a genetic disorder. And the reason is that if your genetics are abnormal, it means your chemistry is abnormal. That means biochemistry is abnormal, and chemistry can be corrected. The people we can't hurt, or the people we can't help, excuse me, are the ones who might have had a head injury or or, or a difficult birth. They have problems that are not chemical. But if you if you've got uh, schizophrenia and it runs in your family, you're you're very likely to be helped by this same thing if you've got a, a violent child and there's a history of um, people with major tempers and violence in the family, they're, they're, they're the best candidates of all. Um, well, you know, that that's really encouraging because it, it's something that I hear all the time. Well, you know, my dad had this, so I'm going to be this way. And, um, you know, I think it's part of their acceptance of their situation. But um, I always think that every situation can be changed on some level. Yeah, these people are actually, they actually are corrected one way. They're born with a tendency for this, but the tendency can be corrected. Um, which is, is amazing. Now, with uh, one thing you talk about in your book a lot as well is pyroluria. Can you tell us what that is? Yes, I mentioned there were seven major chemical imbalances, nutrient factors that have a a, a big effect uh, on, on, on your mental health. And one of these is one called pyrrole disorder. It's actually discovered by Dr. Carl Pfeiffer and Dr. Abram Hoffer jointly in the, 19, in the 1960s. And uh, it's really interesting how they discovered it. They, as they were doing chemical studies on schizophrenics, they were, part of it was involved urine samples. And they noticed that, that as they were, had put their, their urine samples waiting for the laboratory, some of them turned kind of a purplish uh, mauve color. And then they, they studied these people and found that they, they were different from the other schizophrenics. And eventually they discovered that it had to do with chemi- a class of chemicals called pyroles. They originally thought they were cryptopyroles, but there are a number of different pyroles, which are, those are chemicals that are, um, are produced in your in your bone marrow and in your spleen, and uh, they found that people who have really high levels of pyrroles, some people overproduce them. Uh, that they that this really affects their brain chemistry because the pyrroles don't do anything good for you. They just get cleared out of your body, and as they leave in your blood, you know, through the blood and then through the urine, they have affinity and they 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 tend to. They tend to grab onto zinc and B6, and they do. And they, they and basically they strip B6 and zinc out of your system. And so this causes dramatic problems in behavior control. Uh, it, it can, it's associated with a lot of the mental disorders. So pyrrole disorder is one of the one of the major nutrient uh, imbalances that we have to deal with. They also are the people that are the easiest to help. Uh, they they get better quicker. They we've had violent children who were just mean and nasty and violent all day for maybe a few years, and we've had many of them completely changed within a within a week or two. And and it's of all the chemical imbalances that that's the one that um, corrects the quickest. 
So if we've got a patient who might have three different imbalances and they get better immediately, we know it was the pyrroles that, got, that did that because it takes about two months for, mental meta- for things like mental metabolism to improve, toxic overload. Um, but pyrrole disorder is something that is not really yet into mainstream medicine. And I'm, myself, I know of three uh, university studies right now trying to, to, um, to publish information on pyrrole disorder so that it can get into mainstream because it really needs to be. And, and really, it's a condition that involves extraordinary B6 and zinc deficiency. And with, if your mental metabolism is disordered, uh, that, that can cause many problems in your brain. But the, um, uh, but the B6 deficiency might be even worse because B6 is needed in the synthesis of your major neurotransmitters. You need B6 to make serotonin. It's one of the ingredients in your body. Your serotonin, you don't, you don't, we're not born with a lifetime supply of these neurotransmitters. They're created and synthesized all day, every day. And B6 is one of the ma- is major for dopamine, norepinephrine, and also for serotonin. And so if you've got a dramatic B6 deficiency, you can expect to be something wrong with your brain. And it's so easy to correct if a person actually has it. Uh, most people don't need any additional B6. They get all they need from their diet. Other people are born with this problem. It is so easily corrected. So in, in your database, I know we have some of the stats on on um, how many people respond to medication. That was 38%. So how many people do you find with depression that have the pyrrole issue? 15% of depressives okay. have pyrroles as their, as their dominant problem. And and is it is it more common with some of the other things you treat the schizophrenia, autism, ADHD disorders? It is uh, schizophrenia. It's, um, it's it's one of the major causes of schizophrenia, and the reason is if you've got pyrrole disorder, you have extraordinary oxidative stress, and extraordinary oxidative stress can cause these epigenetic disorders like schizophrenia. We know we know now uh, we understand the mechanism of how that occurs, and it has to do with your DNA integrity. And you have these, your, your DNA is torn apart rather viciously all day, every day. In fact, every DNA strand is, is attacked and, and damaged 10,000 times a day. But we have natural DNA repair processes that are quite remarkable that, that fix these constantly all day, every day. And, uh, but oxidative stress, uh, if, it, if it can overwhelm these processes and then permanently change your, your biochemistry, permanently change your DNA expression. And uh, pyrroles, that's, that's, I think, why pyroluria is associated with schizophrenia, with 15% of them. It's also associated with a high number of depressives and uh, even a higher, uh, 38% of all, of all autistics have pyrrol disorder. And uh, it's very, very high in violent children. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's extremely important. It's easy to correct and still relatively unknown in mainstream medicine, but it's coming. Um, well, yeah, it, 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 you know, I, I did, did research into it a long time ago, and there wasn't very much then, but it was talked about in the chronic Lyme world, which is where, you know, I am. Um, but it seems now, and maybe this is the work that you've done, that there is more information on it, which is really encouraging. There is, because Lyme, like many other disorders, has a lot to do with oxidative overload. And, and, and if you have pyrrole disorder, a person would be far more prone to things like Lyme. And, and really, it, would, it has a lot to do with poor immune function in general. Um, but, but it has a direct effect on, on brain function in addition. Mm-hmm. So, what other um, what other uh, things do you see um, that in, in these disorders? Well, one also has to be aware of malabsorption because we need our nutrients to function, and some people are born with an inability to process foods normally, so we have to check on that. Uh, we have to look at thyroid. We're learning thyroid has got really dramatic uh, impact on, 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 on part of brain function. It has to do with ion channels that, are, that sort of dominate um, neurotransmission. And... Um, the, the, so those, those are the major ones. We also need to be very clear on essential fatty acids, especially 
are four fatty acids. There are more than 300 fatty acids in the human body. Four of them are really dominant in the brain, especially at synapses. And they're DHA and EPA, which are two uh, of the omega-3 fatty acids, the, the kind of thing you get from fish oil. Mm-hmm. And, and then there, there are two others, arachidonic acid and something called DG, DGLA. Uh, and these are omega-6s. And uh, most people in America, because we have a lot of McDonald's and Burger King and people on terrible diets, uh, most Americans are low in omega-3, and they have too much omega-6. And so uh, that, that can have a major impact on a person's mental functioning, too. So um, occasionally we have to focus on that also. That's another one of those important factors. Um, so it, it seems that that diet's an, an important component when you're looking at the rest of this. You're not just giving some vitamins, but are you doing some lifestyle changes and, and diet therapy as well? Well, you know, that's true. However, uh, one thing that was a surprise to me was that, was that um, we, we all were aware of that certain deficiencies could cause big problems. But what I learned is that the greatest mischief that's often caused in, in, in behavior disorders and depression are nutrients that you are overloaded in. So it, it, that's why biochemical individuality is so important. You need to really find, to do this right, you need to, if you want to have the ideal diet, you need to know uh, what you need to avoid and what you need to enhance based on your individual DNA. And, uh, and what it comes down to is that some people thrive on a vegetarian diet. For example, overmethylated people thrive on an over thrive on a vegetarian diet. Undermethylated people, and there's more of them, get worse on a vegetarian diet, and they need a, pro- a high protein based diet. So diet's really important. But you, uh, I, I'm constantly asked by people, what's what's an ideal diet, or what's the ideal nutrient supplements? And the answer is, there's no such thing. Uh, if you if you go to a drugstore and get a, 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 a or I have Shackley or somebody sell you multiple vitamins and minerals and amino acids, uh, some of those things might help you greatly and others might harm you. And eventually, I think we're going to be able to do easy, you know, inexpensive testing, help people identify what, their, what is ideal for them. You know, I think it was Socrates said, one man's meat is another man's poison. And uh, I think he was absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Well, I definitely agree because, you know, you, you see that with people. Some people start doing a paleo diet and feel amazing, and some people do that, and they're like, I cannot do this. I don't feel good um, following right. through with this. And um, it makes sense with, with what you're saying um, that there – and, you know, we know this. There isn't one something for everybody because we're all different. So there's no one diet that works. There's no one protocol that works. I mean, I think if you were to take depression – from what you're saying, there's, you know, 38% of people re- will respond to SSRIs and 15% halfway there. And then we've got all these other things going on where it's so complicated with all this other stuff going on that we really are individual with what we're doing. It's complicated, but you know, we're working all that out now. We're learning now that we realize that it's complicated, we're now being able to identify in people with inexpensively, really. And, and uh, identify what what uh, their specific abnormalities are, and so we're cutting through all the all the complexities, and and really it's not as complicated as you might think. Uh, we're able to take doctors, and we have training programs uh, twice, tw- two or three times a year. Where we might have 80, do- 80 psychiatrists and regular doctors uh, le- learning this, and it really only takes us about four days to give them all the information they need so they can incorporate this into their medical practices. And uh, we, we help them afterwards. We, we guide them a bit uh, in answering questions and assisting them afterwards. But it's getting really popular. And um, last, just in the last three months, we've, we've trained um, more than 165 doctors. And it's just, spreading, it's just growing and growing. And I think, I think this is what the direction medicine will take in the future. Yes, I definitely to, hope so. We're trying to speed it up. Um, well, now, um, of course, we're nearing the end of the show, so that gives me a great segue. How can someone um, who's listening find somebody to help them to do this for themselves? Well, um, the book would help. Uh, that would, that's uh, actually the, the, the it's, it's a textbook I use for the doctors when we train them. 
is it's called Nutrient Power. It's you can get it on Amazon, but you can also get it directly from our website. If you buy it from Amazon, uh, we get uh, my charity, my not for profit, gets forty two percent, forty two cents U.S. cents. Uh, but if you get it from us, uh, we 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 get uh, ten times that. Oh, uh, that's amazing! And, and it, so, if if <laughs> we would prefer you get it from our website, which is <laughs> WalshInstitute.org, WalshInstitute.org, and uh, but another thing is uh, our website. If you get on the, on the Walsh Research Institute website, you're going to you're going to have a lot of information. I bet we have thirty or forty YouTube videos. That explain many of the of the of the factors we've been talking about, and and so a person can get a lot of this information, uh, really without having to pay anything. And and if you would like to read the book and don't want to buy one, you can go to the library and uh, check it out. Uh, but I think I think um, I think people need to learn more about themselves and what is healthy and not healthy. Um, now, with respect to nutrients, one thing that everybody could benefit from are antioxidants. We're now learning For that sure. antioxidants have everything to do with cancer, with heart disease, with mental illness, and, uh, Dr. and, sorry. and it's sorry, really Dr. a matter Wilson. of protecting our DNA. So I'm, I'm um, in favor of... We, we do have to close the show, but thank you so much. And, and I, I encourage everybody to go to your website and find more information. Um, we were um, talking to Dr. William Walsh, and the book was Nutrient Power. Thank you so much for listening today. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. 